Okay, let's let's start the webinar. We're here. Um, hi, Lauren. How are you? I'm doing great, Jonathan. Happy to have you here. We've been planning this for a while now. Yeah. So this is our second time to, to at it, um, and and this is the beginning of a three part series. Um, today, uh, the topic is own your expertise, and and it's a stepping up as a trusted advisor. So I have Lauren here, um, and and we've developed a partnership with Lauren. Um, to take her insights as a business coach, um, as a really smart, wonderful, dynamic person, and bring those into our Lima Accounting Pro community. Um, so uh, I think I first want to start by um, allowing Lauren to, to tell us about her background um, and how you became, you know, this pricing expert for accounting professionals. I, I appreciate that, Jonathan. Uh, what, what I would say is that what I found for myself, as well as the accounting professionals I work closely with, is school prepared me really well for that thing that I do, uh, which is helping high achieving individuals get out of their own way in order to be able to reach their full potential. Uh, and over the years, what I've done is start to narrow down exactly who my niche is, uh, which happens to be accounting professionals. And it's part of how you and I connected was through that niche conversation. Uh, what, but over the years, because of school preparing me to be an employee instead of an employer, I, I realized that there were some things I didn't know about business development and I had to be able to fill that gap. Uh, as a result, I have really invested a lot of time, money, energy into figuring out specifically how to have enrolling conversations with potential clients with that when I don't like the sales part and to be able to do it in a way that feels genuine and authentic for me, leading with value as opposed to selling my time. The other part that I really dove into is about how to price your services. Once I figured out half the pricing piece and the selling piece, then it really all started to meld together. And I've been able to really take my background as a therapist, specifically doing sports psychology, and bring the mindset piece as well as the strategy and the tactical steps into the work that I currently do with uh, accounting professionals, helping them to be able to double their income while working half the time. And these are some of the stages that I've been on or partnerships that I've had. Uh, soon I'll be adding Woodard Group um, and Scaling New Heights since I'm speaking there next month. Yeah, Lima will be there as well next month. We're, we just uh, had a conference yesterday with Intuit. We're really excited about our relationship with them. Um, and we'll be, at in, uh, we'll be three booths away from Intuit. Um, so you see that deep integration with, with Intuit. We continue to do that. Um, and I want to make a word on, uh, to the group about what Lauren, before I get into what we're going to learn today, about the importance of this. Um, the hardest thing for most business owners is to take the time to learn how to sell and to learn how to get out there and network. Um, there's obviously the referral, it's such a referral driven business, but even when you're getting good referrals, I just was on the phone with a client yesterday or an accounting pro yesterday and she said, oh, I don't need any referrals. My website's bad. And I, I didn't say anything, but my instinct was you always have to be selling. You always have to be preparing yourself to be able to be out there and understand what your positioning is. So these, this will segue into what we're going to focus on today, which is um, first overcoming the fraud factor. And Lauren's going to get into this in more in greater detail as to what it is. Um, but it's a key component of your own self identity and self awareness um, and, and getting to be comfortable with who you are and what your offering is and how to get out of sort of the commoditized bookkeeping role and into that value add insightful trusted advisor, um, which then she's going to have a blueprint for you, an actual game plan. How do you get from A to B to C? Um, and then last, and I think this, this word failure is so charged. Um, so we're going to show you a new spin on failure and I'll just speak, you know, I failed many times to being fired from a job, which I was embarrassing for me to say that ever. Um, and every, you know, to my company's not doing, previous companies, Lima is doing quite well, but, but for other companies not doing well. And, and I think that there's such a negative connotation on failure, whereas really it's just a natural course. I mean, kids stumble and fall, and then you have to get back up again. And the question is, what do you learn? But she's going to get into that in more detail. Um, 
So let's let's get it going, Lauren. Let's move it forward. You've got the con on the slides. Um, Absolutely. Oopsie. Okay, there we go. All right. So our conductor slide, and 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 really what I want to talk about here is um, why is it why can't you just be a bookkeeper? Why is it important for you know these folks to include advisory services within their offering? Um, why is that critical to their success? Well, I, I think the first part that I really want to go into is that a lot of accounting professionals have so much to give, they have so much to offer, and they tend to place small or minimize their contribution, uh, focusing on their time as opposed to their knowledge. The reason I had the conductor slide there is because the conductor, when you go into the symphony, is actually a lot of times the silent leader. The way that the conductor really does his or her best work is be a, being able to bring a lot of individuals together to have a unified sound and to be able to make the other people in the orchestra shine as opposed to him or as opposed to it being about him or her. And I think that that's something that accounting professionals can be doing now is really starting to be able to step up more as a short, as a, a thought leader, being able to share more of that knowledge that they have because their clients, especially attorneys, uh, really, really need that information. Their clients are so busy, they need that. And the other part of it is looking then at shifting from transaction into interaction. I was doing some research for this particular discussion that we're having, Jonathan. One of the things that I found in the Economist magazine is they're predicting, based upon a study from Oxford University, that by 2030, the way that accounting professionals work is going to become obsolete. It's all going to be replaced by technology. Because of that, that's just 11 short years away. That Because of that, this conversation that we're having today is even more imperative to be able to actually be an early adopter, moving into that position of trusted advisor and offering advisory services, as opposed to just simply focus, focusing on the compliance piece. And this is something that has repeated over and over again in history. Uh, when I think about what the accounting professionals are facing today because of technology, is similar to what travel agents experienced in 1997 when Priceline first hit the internet. That was an industry that just went away and, and it's happened over and over again. Look at Kodak with film, uh, look at blockbusters compared to Barnes and Noble. If you just wait too late, you're going to miss the boat and then you're going to be scrambling and it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, and, and so one of the things I wanted to mention up front, which I forgot to, but I'll do it now, which is, so Lauren has a broad perspective on, on the accounting industry and, and what my job in this is to facilitate the conversation, but to also bring it back to law. And I want to make a comment directly on this. There is an urgency, there is a necessity to bring it into an advisory role. And I also think it's about when you're thinking of law firms, lawyers and law firms are up market and you can be seen one way as a trusted advisor or you can see, be seen another way as a bookkeeper. And I don't mean to be negative in the context of saying a bookkeeper, but you can be an hourly employee who just does a task or you can sit at that lawyer's hip and help her understand financially what's happening. And that might be you know, what happened, which is after the fact, it might be what's happening. And that's the key piece is what's happening now? What data points do we need to communicate to the attorney in a moment that says, hey, your trust to uh, you know, WIP work in progress ratio is off for this client, or hey, this is what your cash flow is looking like halfway through the month. And so we need to make these decisions. So when, if you want to get up in the ecosystem of a law firm and really make yourself sticky, it's about layering in that foundational workflows so that we get good data, that we get good the invoices out, all those pieces, but then be able to assimilate that data and present it back to the team in a way that adds value. And, and then you become a trusted advisor and all the good things that happen downstream. But they want this, they're interested in having, and you just have to create the platform to do it. Um, because they're up market, you need to be up market. 
if you're just a if you're just a bookkeeper, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but if you're just reconciling books, then you are just a simple commodity, and that could be displaced with technology. That could be displaced and brought in house. Um, in many instances, that could be you know taken care of by someone else. Um, I want to actually add to that as you're gathering your next thought um, is that I believe it's possible to lead from any seat at the table. It's not about your credentials, about how many years you have in the uh, particular field of bookkeeping possibly. It's that everything that you've done, all your experience, you bring into the table right now, the attorneys highly value that insight so that they know they're in good hands you have your eyes on their business so they can do the work that they want to be doing, um, which is the legal matter. Um, well, that's right. But I think almost as important, if not maybe more, is that if you've worked with an attorney, he or she tends to run their business on gut. Unless there's that one type of attorney that wants every report ever created. They run it on, on sort of gut and feel, like I can kind of gauge where I'm at based on my billables. And they sort of know it. And they, what they're doing is they're only looking at one piece of the pie. And, and what happens is they're just ignoring their P&L. They're ignoring their, the, the balance sheet. And that's, we see that time and time again. So there's, there's functional value that you can bring into a law firm in terms of systems and workflows and accounting. But then there's this other value, which is this advisory value, which I think is more valuable that assimilates that information and presents it in a way that's effective. Uh, we should get to the next slide, I think. Absolutely. Okay, so um, I love this slide and I love this concept, you know, the fraud factor. So you've got a, a really regimented thing here and I, I, I think this just plays into so much of what are the tables and chairs people throw in front of themselves to stop them from being successful? So tell me, you know, what are the, how do you overcome this concept of being a fraud or feeling like you're a fraud? Well, I think the first thing is to recognize that it's more common than most people think. You're not the only one. I've talked with people at all different levels of their profession, in their businesses, uh, in corporations, they have it at every single position, no matter where they're at or where you're at. So you're in good company. And even when I was working with athletes, a lot of times they had those doubts as well. And, and, and so I put together these five steps to really look at how to be able to move beyond that. Is that the first thing is just having awareness that there's certain times when doubt does come up, becoming aware of what maybe triggers those thoughts that you're having regarding your accomplishments, your ability to do something, whether you have the confidence. And I think that confidence is overrated. It takes courage to be able to do something new or move in a new direction as opposed to confidence. The confidence comes later actually. So just begin to have awareness of when those thoughts start to arise for you. The second thing that I encourage my clients to do is really to have wins. We talk about wins every single time that we have a conversation or that all my clients gather together for uh, mastermind discussions, which are our monthly meetings. I want to start off with allowing you to share what successes you've had because we're usually so hard on ourselves and there's so much to do. One of the things that I also encourage my clients to do is to create what's called a kind words folder. In this folder, it's taking all the maybe thank you cards you've gotten from people, testimonials that you print out that you've gotten along the way, awards or certificates, put them in that folder. That way, when you're having those dark moments, you can pull out that folder, folder and be able to recognize the impact and the difference that you've made for other people. This way, it's not about you. It's really coming from service, you being about you being able to help somebody else achieve what they want. The third thing is avoid- well, okay. Lauren, Lauren, I want to jump in and just give one yeah. little antidote here. So um, this is, Lean Law is my fifth startup. Um, so I'm seasoned. I've been in five early stage companies and I've owned two of them. And I remember someone, 
and my advice always is when someone has a big win, they get the email to this exact point. I always tell someone, park that email in a place that's accessible because what you do is going to be really hard and you're going to have a crappy day or some really bad noise, bad news, and you're going to be in a moment where you really have all this self-doubt and you're going to go back to that email. And I've done this myself where I've actually pulled that email that said, you're great, you're awesome, you're on the right track or whatever it says and use that email to the exact thing as your success folder because you have to be, you have to remember the wins. And I personally have seen this because, you know, what we do, we're all entrepreneurs, is hard, 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 hard. It's so much easier to go and work for another person and, you know, clock in, clock out. They tell you what to do and you make your, your income. But it's very difficult to be an entrepreneur. Okay, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just want to do that number three, avoid comparison. Absolutely. Uh, getting back to the comparisons, the things that I find fascinating is that men compare differently, typically, than women do. Men will compare up. If they see someone else doing something, they're like, oh, if he or she can do it, then I can do it too. Whereas women, when they compare, they're looking at someone and they're wondering, how come I'm not good enough? And that's not happening to me too. So they will compare down. Part of what I wanna encourage you to do is when you're comparing yourself to other people, you're focusing on something that's outside of your control. You can't change that. If you need to compare, compare yourself to where you first started and where you are now. Compare to who you are now as an individual or professional as opposed to when you first got out of the gate doing this. That way, you're looking back and you're seeing all the miles, the journey you've had to get to this time and place here and now. That's, and, and the reason that this is so important is because the horizon is always, always moving and shifting and there's always more to be done. You're never, ever finished. It's that journey and evolution. But if you actually turn around and look back, then you can recognize that distance that you've already come so far. Number four is about admitting mistakes. Let's face it, if you're moving forward, you're doing something you've never done before, success is messy. You will have mistakes. You're not gonna hit your KPIs that time. You're gonna miss the mark as far as your numbers go. That's okay. It's evidence that you're stretching yourself in some way. The best thing you could possibly do is to own it, recognize it for what it is, then look at how you could have approached it differently because you'll be in a similar situation next time around and you want to be able to take the better alternative instead of maybe the one you did. So it, mistakes are actually so important. You have to be willing to have them if you want to be able to step up into that advisory role. Hey, Number I want, five, I want, before I want to jump in, so, um, and I, I can say this freely now, but at the time it was really embarrassing. I got fired from a job, happened in my, mid forties and it was a, I, I wasn't well positioned. And, you know, the first thing you do first, I was thrilled to be fired truthfully, cause it was such a bad fit. I remember driving home going, oh, thank mm -hmm. God I never have to go there again. But the, what was liberating was, you know, I was out, but then it was embarrassing. Like, how do you present it to your friends? You got fired and your wife and everything. And, you know, everyone who knew me knew I was unhappy. So they were happy that it ended, but, when I then started to reconcile it, I had, it. you know, first I was like, oh, it was a bad fit and all these labels that I put on it. But then when I went deep in, and only because I was later in life, you know, in my mid forties, well, I had the maturity to come in and say, well, what did I do wrong? You know, what was my role? Because there's always two sides to something, right? And, and when I went in and investigated and said, oh, I was candidly arrogant and too heavy fisted and didn't listen enough and wasn't a servant leader and did all these things that forced me to not be in that environment and not be succeed in that environment. Only did I get through the other side where I could say, well, oh, I got fired once in my life. I got fired. I will not get fired again, but once in my life. And, and what came out of it was this, this awareness that I would never make those same mistakes again. I became a much better listener. I became far more humble about who I was and, and, and what I am. And so, you know, even the most hardest failures, I got fired I and mean, it was really emotional. I still was able to turn that around in time 
to something positive that I could talk about. So I think that admitting mistakes is really important and then understanding what came into it. Okay, attitude, sorry, I just wanted to interject that, something. That's actually really helpful because it leads right into the attitude. You, you can actually define yourself by the failure and have it be one more reason why you can't take that next step as a trusted advisor. Or you can be have, have it something, as you said, that you can learn from. With the attitude, there's a study done by Carol Dweck on mindset. She says that there's two different types of people for the most part. We fit into basically one or two gap categories. Either we have a fixed mindset where we believe that we are born with all of our qualities and that it's just set in stone. You don't have the ability to really make that much of a change to who you are as an individual. Then there's the growth mindset, which says that you're an individual who sees yourself as fluid and your outlook is about if I don't know, if I can't do that now, then I wanna figure out how to be able to make that happen. The reason that this is important is because if you're not comfortable with the mindset that you believe you subscribe to, you can actually change it to the other one by having that awareness in the beginning that this might be something that's holding you back. So attitude is really important because it's something you have control over and you can either be reactive and feeling that you're not in charge of your destiny or definitely feel that if there's something you wanna do, it's just about figuring out how to make it happen and you can grow into that next version of yourself. Yeah, and, and I would, the one comment I'd bring this back to lawyers is to say that initially folks feel very intimidating speaking to lawyers because they're these professional people and they're highly charged and all these things. And the truth is, you know more about finances than they do. I mean, they may know some nuances of their own business, but you bring a core expertise into that room. And if you have the awareness and accomplishments and all these things that, that mm -hmm. sort of make you feel you, the, 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 that you have the self-worth to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with them, it levels the playing field with them. And there's, and what I've seen is more respect. So Lean Law initially did some services work for lawyers, meaning IT work, and I led that. And I remember early on, because I wasn't your normal IT guy, that I would have a business conversation about tech. And that's the same way, a business conversation about accounting, right? And by doing that, I earned the respect as an equal, at least in this subject matter, and we had a much more fluid conversation than me being a tech who was going to fix a computer. Mm -hmm. And I never wanted to be that tech. It wasn't part of my identity. I'm a business guy. But by just saying, I'm going to speak what I know, and what I know is very, you know, is, is probably right. It's probably more right than wrong. That really created this trust or advised relationship with these clients where I could kind of get to a short language or a short version that says, we're going to do these three things. And of course there's a why, but that's it. So anyways, I just wanted to add that little bit of, of, of nuance about lawyers and being able to rise up and speak to them in equal tone. You are not just a commodity bookkeeper. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. Are we ready for that? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I am. There we go. Okay, so um, the I, what I believe is the most important tenet of the future of the accounting community because there's, you know, there's CPAs that can always do tax, but the rest of us are the ones that are becoming these trusted advisors. So I think that these four steps are really critical to move out of this, this, you know, bookkeeping commodity into the survivor. So what are they? Tell, walk us through these four steps. Mm -hmm. the, the very first one is credibility. Credibility is equated to trust. There's three things you want to look at as you're starting to develop that trust is when you're speaking with someone, especially when it's a client, make sure that they are aware that you maintain their confidentiality, that they can talk to you in confidence and have those deeper conversations than the superficial ones. That means that when you're out there or what you post, have it be about you possibly, but don't brag about necessarily who you work with or what you've talked about. 
have that be really that phase between the two of you. It goes a long, long way. The next thing with credibility is the ability to ask great questions and to be able to listen to the responses instead of just jumping ahead to that next thing that you want to say. That's because people crave to be understood and heard. So you have the confidentiality, you have the listening. And then the third part of developing credibility is empathy. Empathy is acknowledging someone's point of view, whether it's aligned or not aligned with yours. You don't have to buy into it. It's just a matter of acknowledging that that is their point of view and their experience. That's number one is credibility. The second part, which is so important is being solution focused. That's because you have a better understanding of the cash flow, the finances, being able to shift from that compliance piece, which is the reporting, the reconciliation, possibly the KPIs, and help them to really guide them forward with how do they forecast for growth? What are some of the things they can do to plug up those money leaks? And going more into that advisory uh, service instead of just reporting. And with most of them, you can give them reports, as Jonathan was saying earlier. However, attorneys, as well as most other clients that you might have, are not necessarily going to go understand the reports. So what if not only you gave them reports, but you helped to explain what the reports meant so that they can actually put it into practical use? The third piece is detaching. Hold on, I want to jump in. Can I jump in real quick? Sorry to interrupt you, but I want to add a point to that. I, I think what's really critical in what Lauren just said is one additional point, which is you have to find a way to speak their language. Context is everything. And so you have to interpret the financial data you know, in a way that they can understand it relative to what they're doing, whether that means naming their clients and using that as a, a point or, you know, I, I don't know the, the actual words, but what was successful when we started to sell lien law was our ability, mine in particular, to actually speak the language of lawyers, the vernacular, and I picked it up. You know, I, I read online some things, but, you know, understanding case matter, contingency, you know, different types mm -hmm. of law practices, and, and understanding the nuances of them. And so when we speak to lawyers, they have an expectation that you have some understanding of their world. And there's, you know, 10, 12 concepts that are unique to lawyers, like trust accounting and you know, being able to be fluid and speak to that. So I think language is really, really important in that, you know, both in credibility and in the solution focus. Please, back to detach. With detach, it's basically that your position is to give insights, to be, uh, give, inform them about best practices, what might be a good move, what they're doing that might not be benefiting their business, and not being personally attached to whether they follow through with your information or not. You might have a preference as to how they respond to that information that you're giving them, but you're not attached, not taking it personally, what they choose to do or not do with that. That, that is a really key point of trusted advisors is that you're like Switzerland. You're gonna give information, however, you're gonna remain neutral and not take it personally whether they choose to do something or not. And the last one is impact. How can you really share that knowledge and insight that you have in order to have more influence on the way that their business is going? How can you really step up as a partner in their business, to a part of their team members, to be able to help them grow and really have more of what they want? So it's about credibility, being solution focused, detached, not, a, not really taking anything personally, to be able to put your emotions on a back burner when you're working with them and be able to have more impact and influence. Hey, Lauren, how does um, social proof come into credibility? And what I mean by social proof mm -hmm. is the, when, you know, I, and I'm just gonna digress for a half second. When anyone thinks about online marketing for small accounting practices, it's all about being found. It's not about people searching for you. Meaning, you know, Boise accounting person, you'll never win that, that search phrase. 
But if someone looks at Jonathan Fishman, because Lauren said, you got to meet Jonathan, and they say Jonathan Fishman Boise or whatever, I should be found. And when I'm found on my LinkedIn page, maybe on my Yelp page, on my all these different social touch points, I want to have a good presentation. But my question to you is, that should be your focus. But my question is, how does that play into credibility and how do you coach people to, you know, is that something after the fact and, and we, we focus it later in this, or does it play into this credibility that, you know, having a five-star Yelp rating or having a Google business and, and, and do you coach people on getting good reviews and what those reviews might say? I, I think that it depends on the individual and what the individual wants. There's many different layers to credibility Part of it is also understanding where that people might be in different stages as to how ready they are to engage with you. Where are they in the engagement process? If they're just becoming aware of you or that they have a problem and they're doing research um, in general to recognize, do I have a problem with this or not? Then it might be the credibility is about them reading some information that you have out there. How can you put content out in some way? When they're doing more of the research, it's about them being able to discern, can you be the one, can they trust you to be able to take care of that problem? Uh, that's when the testimonials help. It might be that's when you start putting out content as far as videos possibly. Uh, so it's a different type of content when they're in that first awareness stage. And then the third type is really that they're ready to take action. And the credibility might come from that consultation where they're actually sitting down with you when you're sitting down with them and having a value conversation as opposed to a pitch or a sales conversation, then you're asking great questions. And just because you know that particular niche attorney so well, you're asking questions that are specific to their particular needs and how their practice is run, run, that gives you automatic credibility, especially as you said, Jonathan, earlier, that they go with their gut so much. They, they're gonna know based upon that conversation whether they can trust you or not. Yeah, and if you and so just to talk about that, and I wanna add my two cents, because I, I that she, Lauren just really nicely broke it down into three different phases of where someone might be in a sales cycle. And so she said phase one was their sort of discovery and that's where content, and that's really can be challenging for a lot of folks to put out good content. And, and that's just a challenge. I mean, there's just, that's a challenge to put out good content that can be found. But I think that middle phase is they're actually buying and maybe they get referred to. I go back to what I said earlier. That's where it's critical that, you're, that every touch point that someone might stumble onto you, your Google page, you know, your Google My Business page, your Yelp page, your LinkedIn page, all these things that are powering up your profile, are polished and clear with what you want them to be, how you want to be seen as, right? That's, you can control that. Like you may not be able to write tons of blog posts and drive SEO traffic to your website. That could be hard for some of you. But what you can control is your website, your Google site, your Yelp site, your LinkedIn page. And those four things are what people are most likely going to stumble into when, they're, when they were referred to you. And you want to hit that and have them say, this person seems really buttoned up. Um, that, and I think the other thing you said, which is really critical, and I think it's really important when interacting with a lawyer because they're so you know, upmarket and sophisticated, is when you said, hey, you said don't jump ahead with the answer, allow them to finish it. What, what I really attune that down to is be mature and patient enough to allow that person to work the conversation as to what they need to hear versus what you want to tell them. And there's a balance between that. So when I'm selling, there's a lot about what I want to tell them, but I have to be patient to allow them to go through their process of what they need to hear. Because no matter what I say, if they walk out of a meeting and didn't hear what they need to, didn't get what they need to hear, you didn't get the next meeting. They're going to walk out. And especially if you kept stepping on them or they ask a specific question and you have sort of a staged answer that doesn't speak to it. So, you know, when we're interacting in our sales process with Lean Law, we really try to have a conversation. And, I, and it's tough. I'm a talker. I do my absolute best 
to shut up and listen. And I don't always do it well. I, I was just at a meeting yesterday with Intuit. And I remember this woman speaking and I'm like, kept wanting to say something. And I, I guess I was old enough and mature enough to not, you know, jump in and tell her because I really, she wanted to coach us and she's coaching us on stuff I already knew. And so I wanted to tell her, hey, I already know this, but she needed to get out her coaching. She, she, and so it was, I had to be disciplined to let her say what she needed here because she needed to walk through that. Anyways, let's move on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Actually, I just wanted to talk about Kelly uh, because we worked on these things when I first met her. Oh. Kelly's a perfectionist by nature. She has a very high standard for herself, higher than anybody, you know, anybody else would have for her. Uh, and because of that, she would really just sweat it out over that last 20%, making sure that she got everything right, that she wasn't going to step on any toes. She was concerned about pushback and being contrarian if she said something that other people might not agree with. And we began to work with that particular mindset because she is brilliant and she knew that she was holding herself back. As we shifted from perfectionism over to excellence, she was willing to have a little bit less uh, perfectionism. So it's a, it, it, it's a degree. And so she was starting to get okay with it being good enough as opposed to perfect, striving for excellence. But because she was also at the point of being able to share more of what she thought, which was different than what the industry put out there, she, she started to get recognized as a thought leader, which landed her on mo um, morning shows as well as speaking at, on some of the major stages. And, and I just want you to think about that too. People want you to come to the table with your opinions, even if it's contrarian, they actually respect the truth as opposed to you talking around something or sugarcoating it. Yeah, and I think that that's, and it, it, that's really an important thing of what you just said is the direct nature. And again, attorneys appreciate direct nature. Like the last thing a learning attorney wants you to do is not tell the truth or try to spin that. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just point blank because they're, they're conditioned to smell spin. Oh they're, yeah. They, 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 they have a really strong BS. They have a sixth sense. And, and, and the other thing I want you to be really conscientious when it comes to attorneys their mindset was built to find, to, 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 to look for fault, to look for cracks, to look for things that aren't right. They're trained in school. They go through briefs and they look for holes and gaps and that's their mindset. And they have to go through a very methodical process in many of them in how they come to a decision. And what's interesting, and I learned this in my own interaction with an attorney, and I got to keep going because I'm slowing this whole thing down, but he was like deposing me. It was crazy. I felt like I was being deposed. But when I came to the awareness of that's all he needed to do to get through what he needed to hear, that was his process. It wasn't about me or his feelings of like, maybe I'm a fraud. It was just, that's how he pulls information out. And we won the client and all is good. But attorneys think that way and you really have to not be intimidated by it and be open to feeding it. Okay, next slide. Okay. All right, we promised you this. Where are my slides? All right, we've gone out of it. Let's uh, go back. I will get back. Back to present. Okay. Okay, great. All right, All right. we promised it. We promised the <laughs> blueprint to becoming a trusted advisor. Let's hear it. Walk us through this, Laura. The very first one and is really know who your people are. Uh, recognize who is that you work best with. It, it's, it can go beyond what attorneys. The more specific you are, the better. With attorneys, it's such a high, such a vast range of attorneys. Is it ones that do trusts? Is it real estate attorneys? Are they ones that do criminal law? So think about that and not just the demographics of maybe what type of law they're practicing, but also the characteristics, what I call the psychographics. What are the qualities and characteristics of the people that you tend to work best with? So know who your people are. The more specific you are, the better. The second step is your process. When you look at the top accounting professionals, 
you will recognize that they have a system that they take their clients through from when they first meet them to that end result that they deliver and that they promised. What is your system Can you and how well can you articulate the different steps that your clients go through when they're working with you, similar to me sharing this blueprint here? Start to become aware of your system. The third thing is packaging. This is really the sweet spot. When you begin to really niche into attorneys, then you can go ahead and start to productize your services. Because you are doing uh, something that has some similarities from one client to the other, it allows you not only to become more efficient where you get faster, but you also become more effective in the service that you're lo looking at them. So think about how to start to bundle your services together in order to really meet the needs of attorneys. The third one, which is probably my favorite topic, has to do with the money talk. This is about shifting away from trading dollars for hours, the billable hour, and moving over to value pricing. The reason that this is important is that with value pricing, it focuses on what you know, your expertise as that advisor, as opposed to selling dollars for hours. That this is something that changes your entire business model. The other important piece of value, of value pricing is that there's a difference between pricing and billing. Billing occurs after the fact, and your value actually depreciates once the service has been done. It's similar to as soon as you drive a brand new car off the lot, it's gone down in value. It's the same thing here. Whereas when you do pricing, you're getting paid before you do the work. The importance of pricing is that you spend freeing up so many hours that were originally spent chasing money uh, or having to then negotiate your fees, justify why you charge that much and that their bill was that much this month. So pricing, especially value pricing, is actually fairer to your clients yeah. than billing is. Yeah. And that's because it puts you on the same page as a team player with your clients, whereas billing actually opposes you to your clients. And, and I know you have a thought. Let me just finish up this last one, Jonathan, and, and then we can go into that. Uh, and then once you know these other things, it's about positioning. But in order to be able to position yourself, being able to connect with your ideal client, you have to know who your ideal client is. When we think about attorneys, attorneys what periodicals and journals do they meet? What networks do they, network meetings do they go to, associations do they join? What conferences do they attend? and start to be in those places where your ideal client is, where they can then find you instead, instead of being reactive where you're expecting them to find you, you are going up and you're showing up in their neighborhood. So those are the five steps to becoming a trusted advisor. Um, I was gonna make a comment on the last one. Yeah. It might be challenging for some folks to get to, you know, um, a various you know, bar association, but we're, the one thing where attorneys are is they're very civic minded and they're very charitable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you find entities that are civic minded, shiners, that kind of thing, you'll find lawyers and attorneys there because they, you have to remember, lawyers get their clients to referrals as much as you do. And so wherever they can go to interact with other, other folks that run businesses and whatnot that may hire a lawyer, you're going to find lawyers there because that's where they cultivate their clients. And in those more casual settings or those collaborative settings, that's where you can begin to develop a little credibility and trust because you get all this sort of mm -hmm. side by mode. So charities, uh, civic organizations, things like that, that you might already be you know, interacting and doing your time, you probably find some lawyers to meet there and, and, and chat. And it's interesting because lawyers, lawyers will always talk about how hard it is to invoice. You can always use that as a conversation starter because no lawyer says it's a very few say it's breeze. There's no problem. Um, and then the other cut, the other topic you can always bring up with a lawyer is um, overhead. Um, you know, cause overhead for most is a pain point um, process. I think was something I wanted to make a note on. And I, I'm thinking of two pro two lean law folks who are on the uh, chat here. And I remember one of them, um, 
she was like, would follow the lead of the client. So whatever the client, I'm, I'm exaggerating this a little mm -hmm. bit, but she would follow whatever the client needs. Say, okay, I'll adopt everything to the client, even if it meant more labor. Um, and then the other one who's, who you know, took kind of a different approach says, when I come, here's the tools we have to use. So she had a more refined process. And I think the first one is sort of migrating to the, to the other one, meaning she's migrating away from being, you know, oh, I'll just follow the steps of the client, especially when it, it creates manual work. So I think really recognizing your process is important because if you recall, if you remember, every time someone starts a new job, You've got six weeks of clout to say, I want a new desk. Let's do it differently. Because everyone's like, hey, it's the new person. Let's, you know, let's accommodate them. So you've got this voice. At about six weeks, your voice just is gone. And whatever happens has been institutionalized. That's the same with onboarding a new, uh, a new attorney. They're, they want to be told what to do. And, and if you can come in with a process that says, this is how we do it, in most instances, they'll follow that. And because you know that process and you can replicate that process, it's easy to package, it's better to price, and certainly easier to position. All right. Um, let's yep. Go. Okay. Let's talk about right. Elizabeth. Let's talk about Elizabeth. And you can use your keyboard, you know. I, I am using my keyboard. Uh -huh. It's not responding well. <laughs> okay. That, and, and it's all good. Okay, so when I first met Elizabeth, she was a generalist. She was doing all things for all people. She is so service oriented that she would go ahead and accommodate or modify in order to really meet the needs of her clients. Uh, because of that, when we first talked, she was really kind of burned out. Her practice had become very vanilla. She, she wasn't really enjoying it any longer. Uh, and what we did is we started to identify her ideal client and who she works absolutely best with. Uh, that system that we took that I just explained of figuring out how does she take her clients from when they first meet her to where they want to be getting them that result and the benefit to that. Started to productize her services to really optimize her time. And as we went through those five steps, what happened is she went from working a 40 hour work week, five days a week to just working two and a half days a week, being able to not just do that, but because she now specialized, she was able to increase her rates also doing value pricing. And as a result of that, she started to become more engaged. She loved her work again, the difference that she was making for her ideal client. And she went back to taking care of herself also with doing triathlons and skydiving. And, and I don't know why anybody would ever want to work, you know, jump out of a perfectly good plane, Jonathan. That's not what I would do for fun. But she absolutely loved doing these things. Uh, I will tell you another benefit that came out of this, though, which neither one of us saw happening, but she and her husband were moving in two different directions. Once she started to become more engaged, started taking care of herself, doing these fun things again, they got closer together as well. And it made a difference, not just in her professional life, but in her professional life, um, her personal life and her marriage as well. So not only did she go from being very vanilla in her job, being engaged, but it spiced up her marriage too. So who knows what benefits come out of these things when you're really setting up a business and you're doing it your way, really leading with your best um, self stepping up as opposed to playing small and trying to please everybody and being very reluctant to say no. Yeah, I, I think the way I assimilate that to myself is, you know, I focus on joy. And, and, and you know, what Elizabeth did is that if you can find joy in your work, then everything downstream kind of works for that. And if something's not joyful, then it's wrong and you need to rework it. And when you get the right mix of people, process, price, product, I mean, that blueprint, it becomes and should become joyful. And when you're joyful with your work, your whole rest of your life is happy. Um, okay. But, but before you go into that, I just want to say that that is excellent. I fully agree with you. And it's easier said than done because a lot of people are risk adverse. They don't like taking risks. They will hold on to doing things the way that they've always been done forever, as opposed to doing something where they're not really sure of the outcome. And, and the, tr the same is true with what we've been talking about this whole time. Going from compliance into advisory services is a risk. 
uh, but you might actually enjoy it more and being able to give your clients more of that knowledge that's really going to make a difference. The, the same is true also for uh, going from the billable hour to pricing. The billable hour was actually created by an attorney to be able to justify his rates. Um, however, I see the billable hour more like still using a rotary dial-up phone as opposed to a smartphone. And, and it's really trying to make that switch. Yeah, and uh, just another note, lawyers are extraordinary. Go ahead and go to the next slide. But lawyers are extraordinarily risk averse. Mm -hmm. Part of you getting the opportunity to talk to them and, and that's where your process and your positioning all come into play there in the packaging because they don't like change. Their staff tends to not like change and they're risk averse. So having all those things really tight and being very credible helps give the lawyer some ease that you, you know, can help them get from where they need to go and do so in an efficient way. Okay. Um, so, you know, there's a big start on the screen. So where do we, where do we get going? Tell us, well, tell us where we go from here. Well, I, I think that one of the downfalls of going sometimes to conferences, listening to trainings, is that you get all of this information. It's like drinking from the fire hose. Uh, and, and then you don't put anything into play. The, the, and so I want to be able to give you the very first thing to do to start before you do anything else. That is becoming very, very keenly aware of who your ideal client is. You, because you can't package your services, you can't value price that effectively or know where your clients actually hang out if you're trying to be all things for all people. This means that your ideal client is not everyone who has skin. It's about getting more specific. If we're talking about the legal profession, once again, is it uh, attorneys that do real estate? Do they do tax law? Do they do criminal law? And really figuring out that part of it, uh, what size firms do they have? Are they solo with maybe an assistant or are they part of a larger firm that has maybe 25 lawyers that are partners in there. So think about what type of firm you wanna work with, who your ideal client is, that helps to really inform every other step in the process. Okay. And? I'm holding my tongue because we're running out of time. <laughs> I told you guys I had a hard time listening and being quiet. Um, so, So how, you know, as accounting professionals start to sort of build this practice, you know, these services into their practices, um, it, it doesn't always go as, as planned, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you, when you're working with your clients, how do, you, how do you help them work through mistakes? Well, I, I think the first thing is let's just admit that success is messy. When you're really moving in a direction and you've never done this before, of course you're not going to get it perfect the first time. Uh, it's not worth beating up on yourself. Therefore, I really encourage you to have a, what I call a new spin on failure. Uh, and it goes with the acronym for F-O-R-E, like in golf, for, because so many mistakes are made with golf and it's a whole mindset thing. Uh, the first thing is frame. You want to be able to shift how you look at failure, recognizing that you have to be willing to fail and make mistakes along the way in order to succeed in the long run. The other part is even though you might not have achieved that end result, there's probably a lot of successes that were tucked into what you did in your process, although you might have failed and not gotten the results that you wanted. Um, uh, uh, second part is observe. When something didn't go as planned, then look at um, how to be able to detach once again and observe what went well, what didn't go well, and what you could do differently the next time that you're in that situation to have a better result. So without beating up on yourself, just look at this with detachment to get some insights. The third thing is risk. This is about rest, realizing you have to be willing to stretch yourself in order to achieve mastery. The thing about masters 
are that they're always student first. They recognize that they're always in learning mode, that they have to be willing to learn and be a student in order to be the best version of themselves that they could possibly be. And the last one is, edu is educate. Because you took some risks, things didn't go as planned, really look at the insights that you've gained. That way, when you're in that situation again next time, you can have a better result, the one that you would have liked to have had, as opposed to the one that you've got this time around. So that is looking at um, how to be able to have that new spin on failure. In the startup world, we call it a pivot. And mm -hmm. so, you know, mm -hmm. in Lean Law, you, in most startups, you, you have an idea and a concept, a hypothesis, and then you, you know, try to as quickly as possible get to a place where you can validate it. And in many instances, you fail, right? Your hypothesis, you know, it's a hypothesis, but you come out as a business plan, you raise money and you say, you know, the problem wasn't this, the problem was this. And that's fine. You pivot because the key is to, to Lauren's comments is you, you've set a, a hypothesis out and then you've gone about trying to prove it and execute it. And you accept the fact that it, you may not execute it properly. So then the question is, why did you, was there something tactical? Was there something market? And you recalibrate. And success comes with a constant, at least from my perspective in, in the startup world, success comes from a constant recalibration of all of that blueprint that she just described, the people, the process, the product, the price. All of that is a constant tuning based on what you're learning and what you're, you're gaining from your client interaction. Okay, what we covered. Um, so we covered these three major tenets. One, overcoming the fraud factor. Um, the idea that you know everyone has insecurities, everyone has challenges, and having to get through that. Two, which I think is one of the most critical pieces of this, um, helping you rise out of the commoditized bookkeeping um, accounting sort of task-based um, uh, functional offering and to be more of a trusted advisor. And we talked about why that's important, how industries go away. And, I, and we know that there's a lot of folks trying to do automated bookkeeping. And then the last thing we just talked about was a new spin on failure. Um, so Lauren, what's next? What do they can do? What do they, you, we've covered a lot. What do they, yeah. where do they go from here? Well, if anybody resonated with what I shared, they want to step up and become that trusted advisor, want to be able to do that the fast track uh, and really recognize that this it's their time now. I put away uh, three complimentary Grow Your Ideal Business Strategy sessions. It, it's an opportunity for us to really have a dedicated conversation about where you are at now in your business, what is it that you want to achieve? What do some of those KPIs look like? The strategy be, a, be able to do that, as well as understanding what some of the obstacles are and what are some of those opportunities. So if you feel that this is something that really appeals to you, that you're ready to do that, you can go to my website, businesssuccesssolution.com forward slash let's talk. And that's how to get started. Yeah, and you also have a lot of blog content and other things that if they're not if that they can interact with you that way. You speak at major conferences, so there's many different ways that people can engage you. Correct, Lauren? Absolutely. Uh, I love being able to share my information and recognize that people are at all different stages in their journey. If I can help you, whatever way, whether it's from my blog, this webinar or working more closely together. I, I just love being able to make that difference because it's, I lift myself up because I work with a business coach too, Jonathan. Um, and the people that are here lift themselves up. They're lifting their clients up as well. And, and it's just this wave of good that happens. Um, yeah. So, Well, thank you all. We're, we actually did it in an hour, which is impressive to me because I normally am late. Um, I, I thank you all for attending. This will be posted on the Lean Law ecosystem of online content, and we will be both be um, at Scaling New Heights mm -hmm. in, in Salt Lake, and we will also, I, I know Lean Law is going to be at uh, QuickBooks Connect and doing some things with Intuit and doing meetups around these same subjects. So we, we look forward to engaging you all and talking to you, and thanks, Lauren. Talk to you soon. Take care.